We believe that its solution uh, should also be as a result of global action and coordination. And to that extent, we welcome uh, the efforts of the UN Secretary General to create international consensus on loss and damage. Pakistan, as chair of the G77 and uh, China, has also advocated for the inclusion of loss and damage uh, on the COP27 agenda, and we brought this issue up at uh, the COP meeting on the sidelines of the UN as well, and we're optimistic that there will be a healthy discussion uh, of, um, uh, uh, of issues related to loss and damage uh, at the upcoming uh, COP. Mr. Azim. Uh, yes, uh, this is Azim Mia from GEO and Young Group of Newspapers. Mr. Foreign Minister, you and Prime Minister were here on a mission and uh, to make the international community aware of the plight of the Pakistani victims of disaster. That has been accomplished everywhere. This has been mentioned by more than many speakers and the UN Secretary General. So that's one phase. But have you devised any kind of mechanism to materialize the promises or pledges being made by the international community? So far, I think 60 million out of 160 million announced has been done. So, so on your part, you have got, your government has got so many domestic problems as well, but what kind of mechanism has been materialized? So as far this as... Aid, this aid reaches to the victims transparently, effectively, and in a many, very meaningful ways. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. So as far as the 160 million initial flash repeal, I believe we've gone beyond that to 75% of our uh, target, but actually there will be a renewed uh, flash appeal given the size and scale of the damage. Actually, we're still in the rescue relief phase. We haven't entered into the rehabilitation phase. There's still large sections of the country, not only underwater, uh, but this water is steadily uh, re uh, descending towards the sea, and as it does so, it engulfs and arms um, uh, other areas. Once the water does truly uh, recede, we will be able to get a more accurate damage needs assessment done. We're doing so in accordance with the uh, World Bank to ensure accuracy, transparency, etc. Uh, once we do have a uh, damage needs assess assessment, then everyone from uh, the UN Secretary General to the President of France have um, offered uh, to help us in order to galvanize, galvanize the international community and to uh, engage with international finance institutions uh, to be able to uh, overcome what is uh, an incredibly overwhelming situation. As far as the aid received so far, as far as the pledges uh, pledged so far, as far as the assistance given so far, it's all a drop in the ocean. 33 million people. That is more than the population of New York State that we're sitting in today. It is more than the population of many, many countries who were represented here today and spoke at the United uh, Nations. So whatever we're doing, whatever the international community is, is doing so far, is just a drop in the ocean. And it will take us a long time uh, to recover from this tragedy. Thank you. Uh, so Hi, this is uh, Dr. Xu with China Central Television. I have two questions. First, uh, you just mentioned about a chain action by this flood. The flood leads to health crisis, healthy crisis, and then might be a potential food crisis and the economic crisis. So, where do you think is the weakest link? You can break the chain, and how to do that? And the second question is concerning today's meeting, uh, the 70, G77 and China. Uh, the Secretary General, in his remarks, he said, and I quote. The global financial system was created by rich countries to benefit rich countries. We need to balance the scales between developed and developing countries and create a new global financial system that benefits all. Is, do you agree with that? And how exactly, as the chair, as the president of G77 in China, would like to do with this? So, as far as uh, the challenges that we are facing going forward, we're really taking them one at a time. And at the moment, while we're still battling with floodwaters, we really have to focus on rescue and relief uh, and see how we can uh, support those uh, victims of this tragedy. Going forward, we have to have a comprehensive plan for reconstruction and rehabilitation based on the still-to-be-completed damage needs assessment uh, component. But that plan for rehabilitation uh, and reconstruction is where we have to create uh, the opportunity within this crisis. 
uh, the world had to adapt, the world we had to mitigate, and we also have to adapt to the new re realities uh, of climate change. And um, the devastation that this, this flood has caused has given us or will give us the opportunity going forward to not only reconstruct, rehabilitate, and rebuild, but to do so in a better manner, to do so in a greener manner, to do so in a more climate resilient manner. Uh, as far as the UN Secretary General's comments uh, on, inter on the international financial system, uh, he was with me today at the G77 plus China group that Pakistan was chairing, uh, where he reiterated his remarks, calling the international uh, financial uh, system morally bankrupt and pointed to the fact that many African nations uh, were not part uh, of the forming of these institutions. Many former colonized nations were not free and a part of such institutional frameworks. And therefore, he's given a call uh, for us to reassess uh, how such how the international financial frameworks uh, work uh, and for them to do so in a more just manner going forward. Thank you so much, Mariam. Good to see you, Mr. Yes. Foreign Minister. I have a question on Afghanistan, sure. if you don't mind. <clears throat> uh, your Prime Minister today mentioned uh, that some work is being done on um, gender rights in Afghanistan and uh, in his speech. Very quickly, um, we had Afghan women here in this very room a couple of weeks ago, and they seem to be feeling and thinking that the OIC is not doing enough to support their rights and that uh, the OIC has levers with the Taliban that they're not using to support the cause of women there. Uh, what's your response to that one, A, I mean? And then uh, as the chair of the OIC and also as the son of the first Muslim woman to have a democratic government in the world, the late Benazir Bhutto, what's your message to Afghan women and to the Taliban regarding that issue? And then I have another question, if that's okay. And just let me answer this one. So as far as the Prime Minister's speech is concerned, uh, he did uh, call uh, on the government, or the, sorry, the interim government of uh, Afghanistan uh, to respect um, their citizens' rights regardless of gender, etc., if I'm correct. Um, as far as the situation on uh, education is concerned within Afghanistan, particularly female education is uh, uh, concerned in Afghanistan, while we recognize that there's primary education available to women and there's segregated tertiary education uh, uh, available to women, uh, Pakistan, along with the rest of the international community, is waiting for the interim Afghanistan uh, uh, Afghan regime uh, to implement secondary education. Uh, for women as well. As far as uh, my message to the women of Afghanistan and the mis women uh, of the Muslim uh, world, this I don't believe is an issue of the international community or not just an issue of the international community. This should be an issue for the Muslim world, for the Muslim Ummah, and you're indeed correct for the OIC as well. Uh, because Islam is what first gave women their rights. Islam is what guarantees women their rights to participate within society and their right to education. Uh, so we expect not only Afghanistan but across the world uh, for women to not only be guaranteed these rights but these rights to be protected. Uh, I'm actually currently the chair of the Council of Foreign Ministers of the OIC uh, and I am trying before our chairmanship uh, expires God willing to be able uh, to hold an event uh, under the auspices of the OIC uh, to do with women's rights in Islam.